This video will explore the lie of Fiona MacLeod and the Sharp family. William Sharp was born on September 12, 1855 in Paisley, Scotland, and spent his childhood in the Scottish Highlands. He tried to run away from home three times, and one of the times away spent a whole summer in a gypsy encampment. His start of his academic career was from Glasgow Academy. In 1863, his aunt and uncle with their children came to visit London and spend some time together as a family. William became much attached to his cousin Elizabeth, nine years younger than he, who was a sweet, pretty girl. They formed a bond of friendship and later fell in love and were engaged. Later he was sent to the University of Glasgow to become a writer and a learned man of letters. He started to establish himself as a writer with a literary group that included Dante Gabriel Rossetti and Walter Pater. Pater encouraged Sharp for his literary work. His, Sharp's first literary work appeared in the Pall Mall Gazette and was much appreciated by Pater. In 1884, William married his childhood best friend, Elizabeth Amelia Sharp, who not only became a companion, but also a co-worker. Elizabeth was the daughter of Thomas Sharp and Agnes Farquhar Harson, daughter of Robert Farquhar Harson, sometime provost of Paisley, Scotland. Her brother was Robert Farquhar Harson Sharp, who became keeper of printed books in the British Museum. William met William, or I'm sorry, Elizabeth met William after their first 1863 meeting in August 1875, when he spent a week with her family at Danoon on the Clyde. In September 1875, Elizabeth and her sister visited William's family in Glasgow, and by the end of the month, Elizabeth and William were secretly engaged. In 1876, the two Sharp families rented houses on the Danoon, but this holiday finished in August of that year when William's father died. William left for Australia following fears for his health and returned to London in 1877. During this entire period, the couple did not reveal that they were engaged. In 1878, Elizabeth and William announced their engagement when he returned. In 1880, Elizabeth and her mother rented a holiday cottage in Port Maddock in Northern Wales. William visited and caught a severe cold which became rheumatic fever. Elizabeth and her mother nursed him back to health, but over the course of their marriage, Elizabeth would spend large parts nursing William. In 1884, Elizabeth married William after a nine-year courtship. She was 20 year old, years old and he was 29. Elizabeth and William rented a flat at 46 Talgarth Road in West Kensington. Talgarth Road flats are now referred to as artists' flats, and I'm not sure if that's because of the Celtic Revival connection. They expanded their circle of literary and artistic friends, which included William Morris and his wife, Oscar Wilde and his wife, Ford Maddox Ford, and Elsie Martindale. By the end of 1884, Elizabeth and William embarked on a six-year stint of editing. One has to recall how many women were involved in the Celtic revival movement and in Irish literature. Oscar Wilde's own mother, Speranza, was a strong nationalistic voice, and it is important to note the contributions of women to nationalist movements. This was also noticed by Oswald Mosley, who said that without women, a nationalist movement will fail. In 1885, Elizabeth and William traveled to Oxford and then to Scotland, where they rented a cottage at Loch Tarbert. In 1887, the Sharps moved from their West Kensington flat to a larger house in South Hampstead, which they rented for three years and called Westcombe. In late 1887, Elizabeth brought William to the Isle of Wight to recover from inflammation of the lungs. The constant moving did not help his health issues. From 1888, the Sharps held Sunday evening at homes for their literary and artistic circle at Westcombe. In August 1888, Elizabeth and William went to Scotland for nearly three months to visit family. In July 1889, Elizabeth needed a break, and she accompanied the suffragist Mona Caird to Valdez in the Carpathian Mountains. I believe this tract of the Carpathian Mountains are now in Ukraine. In the summer of 1890, Elizabeth visited a friend in South Bantuskin and then met William in North Queens Ferry to travel to Aberdeen and back to Edinburgh to meet family. The rate of travel of the Sharps is really remarkable. It was expensive to travel, it was stressful to travel, and still we see them traveling all over Europe. The stress on William Sharp's health was definitely notable, but he hid it. 
In October 1890, Elizabeth and William went to Heidelberg for six weeks and then to Italy for the winter, staying first with Elizabeth's aunt, Mrs. Smiley, who had a villa near Florence and then to Rome, staying until early March 1891. By 1890, Elizabeth and William's marriage had devolved to that of a mother looking after a child, and we see Elizabeth consistently looking for trips and ways that she could take a break. In, Ro in Rome, William began a relationship with Edith Wingate Rinder, which lasted until his death. Elizabeth acknowledged the relationship and the effect it had on her husband's creativity, partially prompting the creation of Fiona MacLeod in her memoir. William Sharp adopted the pseudonym Fiona MacLeod to publish his work Suspiri de Roma. The collection of the poem was out of inspiration and arousal that came from Rinder's presence. After returning from Italy in 1891, he started writing under the influence of the relationship with Edith Rinder. He wanted to write romances, and what better way than under another woman's name? He published his prose of romance inspired by his relationship with Rinder under the title Ferre, a romance, of, a romance of the Isles. Some believe he chose a female pseudonym to mark the importance of Rinder in his life. Another work under the pseudonym Fiona, Fiona MacLeod, The Mountain Lovers in 1895, was another romance set in Scotland, and this one attracted more readers and critical notices, many of which came from the United States. In 1895, a review for the book appeared by John Lane, who wrote, The very air of the Highlands, with its superstitions and its freedom from restraint, Fiona MacLeod has wrapped up the history of her characters in such an abundance of description of scenery and allusions to Celtic superstitions and beliefs that striking and beautiful as much of it is, the story can hardly be said to have a plot. We do not say a plot is necessary, and some will be quite satisfied with the descriptions of Highland scenery, but it means that the mountain lovers may be looked upon as caviar to the multitude. The multitude appreciated the intense descriptions and it woke in them a romance for Scotland. After his works under the name Fiona MacLeod became famous and had struck a sympathetic composition in the reader's mind, Sharp decided to personify the identity of MacLeod. Through letters in her name and appreciation of her work in her writings, he promoted her personality and he promoted her as a being separate from himself. At times, he treated her like an assistant in his writings, sometimes her cousin and sometimes even her lover in writings to her that were actually to himself. Informing Fiona, Sharp painted upon his wife as well as Edith Rinder to make her alive. Sharp inducted her, his sister, Mary, who lived in Edinburgh, to write for Fiona's own handwriting. Drafts, which William used to write, would go to her sister for copying and then to mail to others. In 1905, for the decade before his death, he lived a complete double life of, fit of his and Fiona MacLeod. He wanted to enhance his literary skills to sell his works, and he saw romance as a means to do so. He kept the identity of Fiona MacLeod safe and private from everyone. He asked reporters who inquired about her work to keep her location private and deflected all requests received to interview this new author. He refused to burst the fiction of his double life, even to the Prime Minister of England, for fear of not getting pension on Fiona's name. The British government were interested in why they had no record of this brand new, critically acclaimed author. Sharp thought that Fiona might qualify for the civil list for pension, and by telling the truth, he did not want to ruin his creativity and this new source of income, and so he kept it quiet. Published in 1901, the poem The Lonely Hunter is one of the most famous works of Fiona. The poem talks about the beauty that lies in isolation. It reads, the happiness of a loner to feel the pain alone and the importance of music to them. The poem beautifully presented the feelings and emotions of an alone person who searches for a hill who might itself be alone. Sharp had previously tried on other literary voices including W.H. Brooks and Countess Ilse von Jaromar, but works under those names failed to gather any attention. Fiona MacLeod was created not just as a female voice for Sharp's fiction, but a distinctly Scottish one. Sharp was, at this point, becoming more aware of himself as a Scot and of the importance of Scottish Gaelic folklore. It's important to note that this was a period of revival 
of Celtic literature. And so the ability to translate ancient works as his wife Elizabeth Sharp could do was incredibly important and something that William relied upon. Many major characters, including Oscar Wilde and William Butler Yeats, were very involved in this movement. And thank goodness they were because of them, we have all of this remarkable Celtic literature that can be accessed through modern means, including the Gutenberg Library, Google Books, etc., because these men and women took it upon themselves to interview um, lower classes in Ireland and Scotland and record all of their superstitions and beliefs. The pseudonym also provided an outlet for Sharp's more occult leanings. He was a member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and an associate of Yeats on the Celtic Mysteries Project, which involved trance and second sight and dreaming true and prophecy. And all of these things would find their way into MacLeod's work. The degree to which Sharp identified with Fiona MacLeod has been a point among his biographers, up to and including his wife, who quoted from one of her, his letters, I can write out of my heart in a way I could not do as William Sharp, and indeed I could not do so if I were the woman Fiona MacLeod is supposed to be, unless veiled in scrupulous anim anonymity. This rapt sense of oneness with nature, this cosmic ecstasy and elation, this wayfaring along the extreme verges of the common world, all this is so wrought up with the romance of life that I could not bring myself to expression by my outer self, insistent and tyrannical as that need is. My truest self, the self who is below all other selves, and my most intimate life and joys and sufferings, thoughts, emotions, and dreams must find expression, yet I cannot save in this hidden way. This was published five years after Sharp's death in William Sharp, Fiona MacLeod, a memoir. The ruse was more than skin deep. From 1894 onwards, Sharp man maintained two simultaneous and distinct writing careers, one as Sharp in his various endeavors, and the other as MacLeod in a lot of Scottish romances, answering letters in character, having his sister write out manuscripts in a woman's handwriting, mailing letters to himself from Fiona, careful that he and his wife would always talk about Fiona as if she was a separate entity to avoid a slip. The stress of this dual existence increased during his later years. Upon the couple leaving Rome, they traveled to Provence, where Elizabeth stayed until mid-1891, leaving only when she became ill with a low fever, identified as malaria, and returning to Eastbourne. In late 1891, Elizabeth and William visited Stuttgart so William could collaborate with Blanche Willis Howard, an American novelist living in South Germany. In early 1892, the Sharps had moved to 11 Bedford Gardens in Kensington, where Elizabeth had a studio for painting. However, by mid-April, William had left for Paris and Elizabeth remained in England. Could this be because William was seeing his muse slash lover Rinder? Elizabeth joined William in Paris in early May, by which time Edith Wingate Rinder had left, so the two maintained their relationship throughout Sharp's marriage. In June 1892, while staying with Mona Caird, Elizabeth had a malaria relapse, and William traveled to Bucks Green, Sussex, to secure a cottage where they would stay for the next two years. They named this cottage Venice Croft, combining the Greek name for Phoenix with the Scottish word for cottage. During July 1892, Elizabeth traveled to Beirut for the Wagner Festival. In late 1893, because of Elizabeth's relapses from malaria, the Sharps traveled to Italy and North Africa, returning in February 1893. In May 1893, Elizabeth traveled to Paris to review the art salon for the Glasgow Herald, and at the end of July, both Sharps went to St. Andrews and Perthshire in Scotland. From the summer of 1893, Elizabeth spent more time in London with her mother, as attributed her continuing health problems to the moist air and clay soil of Bucks Green, and having to regularly travel to London for her art critic commitments. It's likely with Elizabeth in London that Edith Wingate Rinder spent these periods at Bucks Green. At this time, William also undertook psychic experiments, and Elizabeth felt they had a negative impact on his mental health by draining him. From 1894 onward, the Sharps rented a flat at Kensington Court Gardens where Elizabeth lived and could attend her art critic duties, 
while William traveled between London and Bucks Green, where Ringgate probably was staying. Excuse me, Rinder. In late 1894, the Sharps let the Bucks Green house go. In the summer of 1894, the couple spent six weeks in Scotland visiting Owen, the Isle of Mull, and Iona. In 1895, Elizabeth and William intended to spend part of the summer in Edinburgh at Patrick Geddes Summer School, where William would give a series of lectures. The Patrick Geddes Summer School still exists and now is the Patrick Geddes Center. However, William had an attack of angina, which is a condition of the heart, and the majority of the lectures were never delivered. William left for Kinghorn to recuperate while Elizabeth remained in Edinburgh, keeping open house for the students. In 1896, both Elizabeth and William contributed to Patrick, Edi Patrick Geddes's The Evergreen, a Northern Seasonal. Elizabeth and Patrick both had concerns about William's health. And at this point, Patrick saw the need for consistent work in one place, so he offered him salaried work with his publishing company. In 1896, Patrick Geddes published Sharp's work, Lyra Celtica, an anthology of representative Celtic poetry as part of his Celtic Library series. Did William Sharp write this work all on his own? No, Elizabeth Sharp had to help him, especially with translations for Lyra Celtica. Later that year, on orders from her doctor, Elizabeth left to spend three months in Italy's warm climate. Elizabeth traveled with William as far as Paris, met her aunt, Mrs. Smiley, in Florence, and then met her friend, Mona Caird, in Rome. Some biographers tried to create a lesbian relationship between Mona Caird and Elizabeth Sharp. Mona Caird was a devout suffragist, but she was also married and had a son, so I do not believe they were lovers. By mid-1896, uh, Elizabeth and Edith, her husband's lover, were in agreement about William's health and agreed that one of them should always be present with him. So Elizabeth was so drained, she decided she was going to work with her husband's lover instead of fighting her. Towards the end of 1896, Elizabeth and William became godparents to Patrick Geddes' son, Arthur Geddes. In 1897, Elizabeth met some members of the French Revivalist movement, and this movement was dedicated to preserving Provencal culture. By 1898, Elizabeth was focused on her work as an art critic and on restoring her husband's physical and mental health. Throughout the memoir, she never revealed concerns about the extent of Edith's relationship with William, but welcomed her cooperation in stabilizing his health. William and Elizabeth decided to go in August 1899 to the east coast of Ireland as it was less expensive than the west coast. Before they left for Ireland, they gave up their South Hampstead flat. Sharp had a complex and ambivalent relationship with Irishman Yeats during the 1890s as central tension in the Celtic revival mounted. Yeats also described himself as split with his poetic retiring nature in contrast with his ardent nationalism. This is different from Sharp split, which was distinctly male and female. Yeats initially found Sharp not acceptable and later fathomed his false identity, but never revealed it to the public. In 1900, Elizabeth was beset by both bronchitis and rheumatism, which was followed by sciatica. In 1901, Elizabeth and William visited Palermo. In 1902, Elizabeth was obliged to give up her work as an art critic, despite the income that it brought in because she needed to give William round-the-clock care. William had bouts of typhoid, which was due to the intake of contaminated food and drink, and he had also developed diabetes. One has to remember that Elizabeth had, mal had malaria, and so she wasn't in the best of health, but she still was devoted to her husband. In November 1904, Elizabeth and William visited America and the president of Wellesley College, Carolyn Hazard. She arranged for Elizabeth Sharp to tour Wellesley and Radcliffe College and for both Sharps to call on the Julia Ward House and to visit Fenn Hall. Fenn Hall is now known as Fenway Court and is the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. This was Elizabeth's first visit to the United States. Um, one of the diseases that William Sharp suffered from was acute rheumatic fever, which damaged his heart, and scarlatina. He died on December 12, 1905 due to cold. With his weak heart, 
The cold affected him at uh, on his visit to Sicily, and he died at Castello Maniaci on the slopes of Mount Etna. He's buried there in the estate's Protestant cemetery, where a large Celtic cross marks his grave. Differing from the death of Yeats outside of Ireland, there really wasn't a discussion on whether Sharp should be brought back to Scotland as a final resting place, and I wonder if this is due to Sharp's treatment of his wife not being entirely faithful and the overall public opinion of him after it was revealed that he was also Fiona MacLeod. The identical nature of the two identities created by William were guarded closely by his wife, sister, and three of his close friends. After his death, the Fiona letters were examined to be in his sister's writing, but their style and personality were of the various individuals that William relied upon to create Fiona. Fiona's letters poem stories were of a feminine quality that didn't match the writing style of William Sharp. Elizabeth published a biographical memoir in 1910 to explain to the world the creative necess necessity for the betrayal to the society for so many years. After William's death in 1905, Elizabeth consulted mediums and left a record of her communications with his spirit. She became literary executor of William's estate after his death. She compiled and arranged many of William's works under a uniform title of Selected Writings of William Sharp. This five volume set comprises poems, critical essays, papers covering two volumes, and vistas. The title page describes these books as selected and arranged by Mrs. William Sharp. In these volumes, Elizabeth wrote a preface discussing the contents of each volume and the selection choices, the, the reason choices were made. When she died, and some say she died in 1932, I believe she died in 1945. Uh, she left instructions for two packages to be destroyed, which they were. These may have included William's occult Golden Dawn diaries, the results of his discussions with medium or, de or demonic figures, or letters between William and Edith Wingate Rinder that Elizabeth found too painful to publish or was shocked by and wanted destroyed. It is believed by some that the documents had the golden works of the unknown truth behind Miss Fiona MacLeod.